Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business by Paul Jarvis. If so, are you considering expanding your business? What are your plans for scaling? Startups frequently wrestle with questions of scale, and it's possible that the best answer is to keep things small. The conventional growth metric is turned on its head by the company of one. A company's ability to expand is frequently cited as a key indicator of its progress and future success. But in many cases, a small business can be more sustainable, profitable, and meaningful than one that grows too large too quickly. When Paul Jarvis realized that the high-pressure corporate ladder was not what he wanted to climb, he quit his job. He's now self-employed, working from home, and still finding time to surf in the morning. The more he does less, the happier and more fruitful his life will be. So, if you care about your health and want to build a thriving, sustainable business, this book is for you. Jarvis presents a counterintuitive business philosophy, stay small and question blind growth. He provides a refreshing and practical guide, which explains how we can set up a profitable small-scale business bringing in enough revenue and providing you with enough free time and independence. It's a very straightforward model. You must maintain a small size, define growth, and continue to learn. Jarvis explains what he means by a company of one and offers advice on how to start small and keep it that way. Growth has its drawbacks. It's important to remember that not all expansion is good for your company's resilience and independence. It's a problem that the current business paradigm teaches us that we must scale in order to make a lot of money or have long-term success. It is based on the premise that more is better. When it comes to business, we believe that larger companies are less likely to fail than smaller ones. That it's so much easier to just keep on growing is another reason for the constant desire to do so. Do you want to increase your clientele? Hire more staff. We can help you generate more revenue. Increase your financial commitments. Is there another influx of support tickets? Build a larger team of supporters. Despite this, companies have to deal with the beast of growth as Danielle Laporte refers to it. Complex systems are put in place as a result of exponential volume and scale. Increase in resources and complexity necessitates an increase in the amount of resources needed to maintain them. A startup's uncertain operating environment makes it particularly vulnerable to growth's temptations. It is highly unlikely that they will succeed if they continue to grow based on the assumption that revenue will eventually outpace expenditures. More than 3,200 high-growth tech startups were analyzed by the Startup Genome Project which found that 74% of them failed. This was not a failure due to competition or poor business practices, but rather due to the fact that they grew too quickly. Maybe staying small isn't just a means to an end, but the ultimate goal in and of itself. There are many advantages to starting a small business, including the ability to enjoy the lifestyle we desire. In contrast to most businesses, which aim for ever-increasing growth, only one company has set firm growth limits. On purpose. A one-person business keeps its size small. The purpose of being a one-person business is to improve, not to grow. During a morning surf in August, Jarvis accountant friend confided in him that he had just made enough money to take the rest of the year off and pursue his passion for rock climbing. He knew how much money he needed to live comfortably and had already accumulated it, so he didn't feel the need to accumulate any more. He didn't want to expand his accounting firm, take on more staff, or pay for more office space because of this. Not expanding but improving was the primary goal of his company. Is it possible that we can improve our business in ways that don't rely on traditional growth channels? Small businesses and freelancing are not the same as a company with just one owner. Contrary to popular belief, a company of one is neither a small business nor a form of freelancing, as implied by the title. If you've ever wondered what it's like to run your own business from the comfort of your home, you're not alone. For some small businesses, bigger is better and they may actively seek to expand. When the costs of expansion outweigh the benefits, a one-person business may opt not to expand. It's important to remember that time is money for independent contractors, who only make money by working. A sole proprietorship typically aims for a steady flow of revenue from their products and services, which means they have a passive income. Anyone, from a sole proprietor to a large corporation, can benefit from the mindset and model of a company of one. Keeping your business lean and agile will allow you to have a more enjoyable and meaningful life, regardless of the current economic climate. To his credit, Jarvis went along with it and learned a great deal in the process. Since leaving computer science, he's been working in web design. He eventually grew tired of their love em and leave em approach to customers and quit doing business with them altogether. 
He also disapproves of their focus on quantity rather than quality when it comes to client relationships. In the end, Jarvis realized that this type of work wasn't for him, and he was looking for something else. He had the bright idea that he would work for himself. This prompted him to read books about starting a business and to learn how to do so. You may be surprised to learn that a model like this can actually benefit both your wallet and your overall sense of satisfaction in the workplace. Start small and build from there. When we're just getting started, we tend to put too much emphasis on things like office space, websites, business cards, computers, and scaling. In order to keep costs down, Jarvis insists that we wait until we're making money before implementing any new ideas. As he warns, you're probably thinking too big too soon if the startup costs a lot of money, time, or other resources. What can be done now, cheaply, and quickly can be iterated upon. Starting a business is traditionally done by obtaining an investment from a bank, a wealthy relative, or a venture capitalist. After securing the necessary funds, we devote ourselves to creating the best possible product for our customers. Trying to achieve perfection has its downsides. This leads us to believe that we know everything we need to know about the market before we even begin. Consequently, we tend to spend a great deal of money before seeing any results. The challenge for a company of one is to get off the ground quickly and without any capital outlay. On his first online course, for example, the author originally planned to have 30 lessons. In order to create this, he would have needed four to six months of his time. Additional software development, which could take another four or six months of work, was also part of his plan. To save time, Jarvis opted not to create new lessons or software from scratch but rather to start small with what he had on hand. It would allow him to launch in a month instead of a year. When he launched quickly, he had the opportunity to see how an actual audience would react to his ideas. Paying customers input allowed him to make adjustments and iterations that would have otherwise been impossible. Having completed his sixth iteration, the course had generated enough income to cover all of his living expenses and expenses for the time being. Before you give up your day job, learn a marketable skill. People's desire for greater personal and professional autonomy is fueling the growth of one-person businesses. However, competence precedes autonomy, and having complete control but no idea of what you're doing is a recipe for disaster. In other words, before quitting your day job, develop a set of transferable skills. Take Tom Fishburne, for example. The idea of making a living as a cartoonist seems a little out of the question. Fishburne, on the other hand, charted his own course to success and now runs Marketoonist, the gold standard for a one-man show. Fishburne left his high-flying corporate job to pursue his passion for drawing cartoons full-time. Emotionally and financially, this turned out to be one of the best decisions he ever made. He made two to three times as much money as a cartoonist in the seven years since he left his executive position. He enjoys a good work-life balance because he works from home and doesn't have to commute to the office. Fishburne's success isn't a fluke, but rather the result of careful planning. He has an MBA from Harvard and has worked for a marketing firm for over two decades. Early on, he began to draw cartoons. For fun, he began drawing cartoons and submitting them to the campus newspaper during his college years as a side job. Over the course of his career, he was able to earn a living by drawing in his spare time, which he did on weekends and evenings. A full-time career in his hobby began only after he had amassed enough clients and saved up enough money to do so. As a general rule, you need to practice your skill before you can expect to gain complete control over it. We want to stay as small as possible. To what extent can you grow before it's time to stop and rest? The concept is that we need to improve, not grow. Sean D'Souza's case comes to mind. He set a profit goal of $500,000 a year and decided that his company couldn't make more than that. When he's not running psychotactics, he can be found teaching other companies about the psychology of customer behavior. As a result, he earns money both online and in person. Because he has built his company around his vision of the perfect life, D'Souza's primary focus is on making a specific profit target and not going over it. Every year, he takes a three-month vacation. In order to fit in long walks and coffee breaks, he gets up at 4 a.m. and works in his garden office. Instead of focusing on increasing profits or beating the competition, he concentrates on improving his products and services for the benefit of his customers. D'Souza is of the opinion that businesses frequently overlook their current clientele, the people who are actively participating in making purchases. He focuses on keeping current customers happy, rather than chasing after new ones. He has even gone so far as to send customers a box of chocolates with a handwritten note or a small cartoon drawing, a $20 cost that often results in a customer purchasing a $2,000 training program. As a small business, you benefit from this advantage. 
Debate the myth that self-employment is the solution. Keep in mind that when you work for yourself, you are your own boss. You don't have an HR or an accounting department to take care of payroll, and you don't have a sales or marketing team to generate new leads. We often fall in love with the idea of working for ourselves, but fail to grasp the actual day-to-day -day responsibilities of running a business on our own. Everybody wants the noun without doing the verb, as Austin Kleon puts it. We're drawn to the job title, business card, and website, but we ignore the daily challenges of running our own business. As a result, we all need a North Star. What will be our long-term motivations? ABC A long-term sustainable goal isn't to become rich or famous, so exercise caution here. We need to sift through the rubble to find the answers. Do we have a job that we want to do for ourselves, and one that we want to keep improving? What will keep us going when things get tough, or take longer than we had anticipated? It's about having the ability to make your own decisions for Jarvis. He has the option of turning down a project or customer that he doesn't think is a good fit for him, and thus reducing his income. He's free to take a three-month break from work and go on a road trip. If he wants, he can choose his own work instead of being told what to do. Although there are some bumps in the road, his ultimate goal, freedom of choice, keeps him going. So that's it. When we think about starting a business, we often think about what kind of life we want outside of it. Overall, we should be more selective about how big we want to get and resist the temptation to grow quickly. So, if we choose to work in a fast-paced corporate environment, we must accept that there may be a little room for other pursuits in our lives after we leave work. Or, if we want to work in the world of growth-focused venture capital, we must be aware that we will be held accountable to both investors and customers, each with their own unique set of requirements. It doesn't matter which option you choose, they're all just options. There are consequences associated with growth in this book, and we are encouraged to question their value before taking them. So, how do you define a good work-life balance for yourself? What is the best way to keep things simple, develop a marketable skill, and create a unique product with excellent customer service? In other words, how can you make your business work for you rather than against you? Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.